Okay, hello everyone. I'm David Garnes. Welcome once again to the Little Theater of Manchester. Uh, as I said in our earlier play conversation last week, I'm literally at home, of course, during this pandemic period, as is my guest, Linda Ferreira. But I'll say again, we're at Cheney Hall on the Hartford Road in Manchester in spirit. So today's conversation, another in our efforts to keep in touch, be productive, and to try to keep the theater lights burning. So I'm the dramaturg here at LTM, where I write and talk about our play productions. Linda is the director of our latest venture, a reading of Karen Zacharias' comedy, Native Gardens. Now, I want to say right now, and I'll mention again at the end, that we'll be presenting online twice next week this play on uh, Tuesday, September 29th at 7 p.m., and then on Thursday, October 1st at 2 p.m. For further details, uh, you don't have to, you know, remember this from now, but for, so for further details and, and that information, check out the Little Theater of Manchester's website on our, or our Facebook page. So let me introduce Linda, Linda Ferreira, who is a longtime member of the Little Theater community and an active participant in many aspects of what goes on at the LTM. So hi, Linda. Hi, David. So we're, we're here to talk about uh, our play, Native Gardens. Uh, but first, I think I'd like you to tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, how, for example, how and when you came to be at the Little Theater and what have been some of your roles here, both both on stage and, and behind the scenes? Sure, so I sort of walked through the doors maybe the first time at LTM, it had to have been maybe 2011-ish. Um, and it was during one of their volunteer open houses. And I went because my daughter was very interested in theater. And I said, oh, let's go check out this local theater. They're doing this volunteer open house. Um, she got involved, but I got involved even more because she went away to college and I was still around. Uh, so came in, initially got um, did some ushering and that kind of thing, but then started going and helping out in the shop. So I'd go on Saturdays and help build the sets, which then worked into becoming the production manager for the theater. And I did that for four years where I was responsible for all the different aspects of the plays. Um, and since then I've done set design, I've done props and a uh, little bit of sound, lighting design, you name it. I've kind of touched a little bit of everything, done stage crew. The only thing I probably haven't really done is costumes. Um, not very great with the sewing stuff, but otherwise hit just about every aspect as well as directing. And I've been in a few shows as well. Yeah, I, I've, I've seen you in a few shows. Uh, yep. I'm trying to think what comes to mind right now. You were in Harvey. I um, saw you. I was what? the stage manager of Harvey, so I've done that. Oh, okay. Where well, I, was, I was in Almost Maine and Sons of the Prophet was probably. Yeah, that's where you were a nurse, right? Yeah. Yep. I, I'm thinking of the nurse in the in the hospital, not the hospital, but the place in Harvey where yep. he ends up, you know. Uh, also, I have to say, I when we did the evenings at seven reading of uh, of uh I'm, I'm trying to think the normal heart you were absolutely terrific as as the doctor oh that was a lot of fun thank you very I much i want to say that yes um okay so you've done just about everything really do you have a favorite a, a, a task or role among all all those that you've mentioned i think i i really enjoy directing and which has been a more current thing that I've done, and probably next would be stage managing. Yeah, do really any, like being involved. In say, like, do you have a specific what what appeals to you about directing? 
I think it's interesting because, you know, if you have your choice of a whole bunch of things and you kind of can quite easily say, but this is my favorite, there probably are some specific reasons. Yeah. yeah, I think one of the reasons that I like both directing and stage managing is you were involved in everything, you know, and so you you see the entire production beginning to the end from the auditions to it going up on stage and you're involved in everything. And I think what I like about directing, you 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 get to make the decisions on a lot of those things. So you're not just involved, but you're making the choices. You're working with all these people and collaborating and just watching it all come together. Yeah. It's just so, so much fun. Uh, so we let's let's get into talking about um, Native Gardens uh, that, that's coming up uh, next week. This is a comedy that has had uh, quite a few regional productions. I did a little research and I was surprised. I mean, it's quite established and has been produced. Uh, in fact, Zacharias ended up being named one of the most frequently produced directors, kind of of the newer directors in the country. And I think a lot of it was because of the several productions of, of this particular play. I was surprised about that. I know that Trinity Rep and Providence did it not too long ago, I think. And I believe it was on the Ivoryton Playhouse's uh, schedule when the pandemic hit. I think it was supposed to play in maybe April or May, but of course it 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 didn't. And we all we all know about that all over the the state, the country, and the world. Um, as I mentioned, this play is written by Karen Zacharias, uh, and I did say how how produced she is. Uh, I didn't. I really didn't recognize the names of her other plays, but I was impressed by the fact that she, you know, imagine one of the, the top 10 uh, directors in terms of, of productions. Uh, she's also, and this I was impressed with too, she's had an association with the famed arena stage in Washington, DC. And and she, she's one of a number of uh, Latinx women who are having an impact on the current theater scene. Uh, and, and that's reflected, I, I would say, definitely in, in this play in terms of, of uh, at least one of the characters. Uh, so tell us a bit about the show. Like how, and how did your directing of the play come to, come to pass? Sure. So the play itself um, takes place in Washington, D.C. So I imagine that, uh, that the playwright sort of drew on her experience there. So it's in Washington, D.C. in a neighborhood where you have an older couple who's been there a while. They're established. They've lived in their house for quite some time. Their son is like 40 and has moved out. And then you have a younger couple who have just moved in next door. And the play really centers around the fact that between their two backyards is a fence. <clears throat> and it's a fence that the um, the younger couple would like to replace because it's kind of falling apart and doesn't look very nice. And, and a dispute arises over this fence in the backyard. So a lot of fun. Um, it's, it's very current day. So it's really about conversations that you can totally imagine happening with anybody. So, and I came to direct this I was originally supposed to do um, an Evenings at Seven show, and it was slated for the fall time slot, but it needed a cast of over 20 people, oh. and it was a very physical comedy that just was not going to work in sort of this virtual environment. Um, th there's no way we could put 20-plus pot boxes on a screen and have people know what was going on. So I looked into another show to replace that. And I had seen Native Gardens um, at another local theater. And I was like, I really enjoyed the play. And I thought that would be a really good story to be able to do virtually. Um, it, it, you know, it doesn't have quite, you know, the physical comedy, there is some of it, and, and we do our best with that. But it really is a story that can be told through its words. Um, so it just really had an appeal for that. Yeah. Uh, so it's uh, so you would describe the play basically as a comedy, although I sense 
because of the what I read. I see. I haven't seen this this reading uh, because this is all happening kind of fast. Uh, but I sense from what I what I read, what I found out about it, that it also touches on some significant things that might be kind of topical as well. Am I right about that? It it absolutely does. It touches on topics of privilege um, and and race and all sorts of things like that, which is very, very topical today, which is, it's kind of interesting how even when I saw it, you know, it's definitely things from today, but even more so with, with more current events that have happened. So it's very topical, but one of the, the nice things is it was written to do it with some humor. So yeah, there, there are issues there and you see them and it's things people say, things people do, but it is done with a, a touch of humor. And some of the, just the lines are, are great. They just, you know, you, you can't help but laugh. Yeah, although I saw several excerpts from other productions on, <laughs> on, on YouTube and I, I thought it was pretty funny. And yeah. I might not have gathered that there was more, a little bit more going on had I just looked at the excerpt, because I think they probably picked the excerpts to have some, you know, like immediate laughs that you'd have an immediate reaction if you, and maybe would want to see it because of that. Um, so you, you mentioned the two couples. My sense is that the two couples, their, their ages, their place, their situations in life, uh, their, ethnic backgrounds, at least in the case of, of one of them, are are deliberately, they're different from each other. And could you want to say a little bit about that? Or is that give, we don't want to give too much away about the play, but um, how much does that play into it, do you think? Oh, very much. So the, the couple, the older couple that's established, they are your older, traditional white couple. And that's what they are meant to be. And, you know, that's kind of even in anything that you would read online about the story. The the younger couple that has moved in next door um, are both of, of a, like a Latinx background. Um, so the, the one... Oh, so the husband is too, huh? Yeah. Okay. The husband is from Chile. Ch oh, sorry. Chile. So he's Chilean. And um, the wife is is American, but has an appearance to be, um, you know, from a, a Latino background. Yeah, so, yeah. And is very, very much part of the show, the fact that these two couples are very different. Um, and that's where a lot of the, the entitlement privilege and those things come into play. So again, yeah. very, very topical for today. You know, when I was doing my very slight research on this, a play that crossed my mind, but I'm thinking, except for the basic premise, uh, it probably isn't that much similar to it. But uh, we did, as a reading, God of Carnage at one point a couple of years ago. We're, do you, you remember when we did that? It was yeah. about the, the two couples who get together because there's been a altercation between their two children. And it starts out as a kind of pleasant thing, and then it gets the tone decidedly changes. I, I don't think that this play probably goes nearly as far in terms of the really kind of ugly drama that occurs in God of Carnage, but it's an interesting premise when you have four people, two couples, who are brought together in some way or another and then difference is in their their lifestyles, their their ages, whatever. Add to the the whatever the conflict is that escalates as the play goes on. But I get the feeling that perhaps the people in this play might be a little nicer than a couple of the characters in God of Carnage. But yeah, but it's funny that I thought of it because I thought. That's a situation probably that a playwright would be very interested in. You know, what happens when there's a a, con, a, a a relationship that probably wouldn't exist except for happenstance between two pairs of people. 
and you know how do things get resolved? Yep, and, uh, and in this case, they happen to move in next door to each other, so that's yeah, um, yeah. I mean, they never, they probably would not have socialized otherwise, correct? Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. I, that, that's. I think that's very interesting. You know, uh, there are several plays that have that kind of uh, either chance meeting or. Uh, they're brought together through some kind of accident or wherever. And I think it, it can work really well. Uh, I, I'm, I'm looking for, I'm glad that this play takes a little bit more of a comedic uh, point of view. Anyway, uh, okay, so let's now, as we all know, we're doing these productions. This is the, well, we've done a few now since we've been forced to be online. Uh, and we are doing a series of four plays, one last week, this week, and then a couple coming up in October. Uh, so we're we're kind of getting, I don't know if I would say we're getting used to this, but we're getting a little more adept. We're getting more uh, accustomed as viewers, I am, to seeing this kind of, of uh, presentation. But from your point of view, putting it all together, uh, what what if anything about the the remote rehearsal and et cetera, all of the preparation that needs to take place where you probably i don't know if you've ever had a face to face with the people that you've been directing but how how is is that so different from a usual rehearsal procedure that you found it difficult or challenging the actual rehearsal process, like we never did actually meet. We, we met on Zoom all the time. So yes, we were face to face, but we were never in the same room. And I think that's that does make it different because you're each home and sort of in your own place. And then you're doing this, which is a lot of fun. And there's definitely interaction, but it's not the same as being yeah. in, the, in the same place. And then just doing the rehearsal normally when, when you're directing, you're blocking and people are moving and here you have to think, well, I can't have them move because then they're not in their camera anymore. And we try to do it so that you can see their faces. So sort of trying to work it out that, that you know, they can get things across just with facial expressions and much fewer body movements than actually having them physically move. There's no yeah. set. So, you know, um, yeah. even for the actors, harder to to think about, well, what would be here? What am I supposed to be looking at when they're, they're sitting maybe in their kitchen or, or wherever it might be? Yeah. Yeah. And then definitely a challenge with props um yeah. you know and we've seen it in some of the other productions and they've done a great job but but trying to get people to pass things you know so it looks like they're going from one screen to another is definitely something that we had a, we spent part of an evening yeah. just working on pretending to pass things and trying to get a similar prop in everybody's house because yeah, instead of I doing really one you need it three times you know yeah so. So it was yeah, definitely, we've got, and we have. I noticed in last week's play, there, there were, there was one point where a, I think a pitcher of water or a glass of water was passed between two people, and of course we're seeing kind of a gallery of characters. But you have to remember that if they're going to pass, those two people have to be, you know, in the two adjoining boxes, and mm -hmm. I guess you really have to kind of measure or figure out where they're going to so that they can meet exactly when the when the giving and taking occur it, i i found that really interesting and i thought this doesn't just happen this this must have taken some practice like did you have several takes or did you did you do it without recording it and uh, oh for what, sure did you kind of do it live or how we definitely yeah, had several of our rehearsals, our Zoom rehearsals, where we were just practicing how how to make it look sort of like things were passing across, yeah. um, you know, and, and you do the best you can. And, and even just making sure that, oh, if somebody's passing a glass of, of a beverage across, 
making sure they both have them filled about the same height because you don't want to see a full glass. Oh, glass. Right. Okay. It's just see, all the little okay. things. It's not the same glass, is it? <laughs> no, it's not. It's absolutely not. And just yeah. trying to say, oh, well, what does your glass look like? Because mine looks like this. And is that close yeah. enough? That's so really it, funny. It, it was quite humorous to try to yeah. sort of pull it together. Yeah. Here I'm saying how, you know, oh, I figured how they must have had to do this. And then it never occurred to me that, you know, the, the amount of water is significant, too, because... <laughs> It's not the same glass that's magically going from one place to another. Exactly. Um, yeah, that that's that's very interesting. I find this whole new world. Uh, although I guess you know we've we've seen things that are online. We've seen, but not quite like this, and certainly not as many things as I've seen. You know, all together since March with other other theaters or even interviews with people where they normally would be sitting talking together and it it's it's just different and it makes me think that can you imagine 40 or 50 years ago when they were would be rehearsing a broadway show to have it all have to be done this way i mean it's pretty amazing it, it, it's it, it's it's a new world and i wonder how how much we're going to adapt some of this technology uh into what we come to think of as the permanent way that some theater will be done. Because it's uh, one of the things that, that I wanted to mention and also ask your opinion is, uh, of, is the fact that as a, as a viewer, I think that it gives the viewer an opportunity to see the players unless you're right in the front row, you know, of a real theater in a much, much closer. I mean, the perspective is so, so different. And um, I, that to me is one of the things that I almost would say is a kind of an advantage of, to the viewer of, in this respect. Um, is there anything that you noticed as director that, what do you think about the fact that, the, because they're really looking right at you you know, most of the time, in fact, you know, 90% of the time, you're really having a someone speak to you, uh, even though they're speaking to among each other. But any thoughts as director about that? I, I was, I'm really impressed with, like, you're really getting a good seat, so to speak, you know, as a viewer. Yeah, I, I think the audience, there, there's not a bad seat in the house, so to speak, because mm -hmm. yeah. you're right there, you can see everything. Um, and I and I think that is an advantage. And because you're not, you know, when you're in the theater, there's so much to look at. You know, there's a set, there's costumes, there's so many things that can have you, you know, distract you. Let's say from what's going on here, you're really just focused on on those people on your screen and what they're saying and the story they're telling. So I think that's a really nice advantage um, is, is that you're really getting to tell that story without a lot of the other stuff around it. Now, all that other stuff is great and it really makes that experience of being at the live theater what it is. Um, but with the virtual, it's, it's kind of a, a different but good different um, approach and, and something I don't know. I find it really fascinating that you're really able to focus more on what they're telling you in the story and not all the yeah, other things. I agree. And I think that's certainly true for the viewer. Uh, I, I mean, I've seen we've done several uh, shows now this way. Uh, I'm thinking back on when we uh, when we did Wit and we did other desert cities, too, as 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 you as you recall and as. Our, our viewers, people who are, are watching may recall if they've been at, they've seen other productions. Uh, and I, it, I, even though I know a lot of the people who are acting, I, I almost feel I'm seeing them in a way that I've never seen them before because they're, you just see every single expression on their face. And it, it makes me realize how I, I've never acted, but how I'm always impressed 
by how they stay in character when because they're on the screen you know when they're listening i mean they may not they may be taken off when they go off stage so to speak but um you know they're they're in character and pretty soon you kind of forget you know i find it interesting that with all the genres that we've experienced with drama you know of course beginning with people seeing a play but then radio you know in radio when you heard a play on the radio when i was a kid i can remember you know before tv you really had to imagine everything you heard the voices but you had to imagine everything here we have to kind of imagine with this this remote uh visual but visual uh you you can you can see the actors, but you still have to do a certain amount of imagining too. And I don't think that's all bad. I think it 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 makes you think a little bit more. And and you do have the opportunity, as I said, of seeing the people close up. Um, do you feel as a director that there are any advantages that you've noticed? I mean, how in terms of rehearsals? at least it makes it easier perhaps sometimes for people to be at a rehearsal i might think if yes if they have to travel far right yes scheduling was much easier um Interesting. well partially too because with everything going on with the pandemic people don't have as many activities or other obligations so, so the scheduling was easy and it was nice because you could just set a time you log in it's not like anybody had to drive as long as they were home everybody was good to go so yeah. it, it was definitely helpful with that yeah. and i guess with your phone if you use a phone it would be easy enough to or a tablet where you have can get wi-fi you could you could you know if you're still at the office you could just stay and do it i mean it's it it's it's quite it, it's as i said it's a it's a different it's a different world uh i've i've um as i said i've seen several excerpts of this show from productions that were that were on stage i was going to say real productions but i don't want to that sort of demeans the the remote production so let's just say in-person productions uh and i've been impressed by the different sets that have been created for this show and the set if i were a set designer and and the director or whoever is you know planning the whole production i would think this would be a, a very interesting play to do the set because they have to tell us a little bit about how you would imagine the set I've seen it so that it's quite clear. You can tell the difference between what's on one side of the property and what's on the other. And then it, the set in the, in the views that I looked at, in a way, some of the set becomes the barrier. I mean, the, the dividing line. Uh, so do you, how, do you find it, uh, how conscious were you of the fact that there was really no no way to depict this this division this set where one side is traditional flowers the other side is not and then the the, the division itself becomes kind of a, a a sort of a no man's land you know that's being disputed um i'm wondering how you did you feel that was a disadvantage to have to be working without a set in this particular play Yes and no. I mean, I, I think the play still has a lot to say with or without the set. I mean, the the whole dispute is over this this fence between the, the two backyards. So certainly an important part of the story. Um, we, we are going to try to do something a little bit fun with the, the video and stuff to try to help uh, give some of that um, to the audience that they wouldn't otherwise. And then one of the things that I've I'm asking to have put in that hopefully will all come together is to provide some of that information to the audience, just in the form of sort of stage directions that yeah. the audience can, can read um, so that they can get that visual 
before watching the scene because it is harder you know obviously everybody's in their home and we're not on the set with the the two backyards so i'm trying to do things to help sort of get the image to to the audience yeah because the traditional as they called it the traditional english garden and i i read some of the stage directions in a abbreviated version and it some of the sets i saw had really gone to town with that concept you know yep. uh, so let me see uh oh i i know what i wanted to ask you now when you when you became the director then of this how were you how did you how did the cast get assembled did you have particular people in mind or when we are doing these productions how what kind of cast procedure casting procedure is followed yeah, so for this time, I picked people that I had worked with before. You know, we were doing this pretty rapidly of, of a change from going from the original show that I was going to do for Evenings at 7, where I wanted to have auditions and all these people and get all sorts of new people involved. Um, and, and we were trying to do this pretty rapidly. So I did pick people that I'd worked with before. Um, now, the two couples, each couple knew each other already but the two couples had never met which was kind of fun it's similar to in the show with <laughs> with the oh, new couple well, no, yeah. yeah so that was kind of nice that yeah that, that yeah. they hadn't actually ever worked with each other before yeah i i think i i think i own i only know one of the players one of the four you know fairly well the others weren't that familiar to me so it's going to be in Marge is Marge Payfield is the person I'm that I'm and I can just see her in this part do I'm looking yeah. forward to that uh, so having had this experience this kind of directing would you would you remotely would you do this again oh absolutely yeah. I, I really enjoyed it and it to me it just presented new challenges and half the fun is figuring out ways to overcome those challenges, figuring out how to pass the props and how to do the things and get the facial reactions. And, you know, each time you do something, you learn something new. So yeah. I would definitely do it again. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think it's exciting. I, I mean, I, unfortunately, you know, the reason that we're having the opportunity to see this is not so much fun, but, being what it is, I think that I think that theaters are doing really quite well in experimenting and you know trying, as I said, trying to keep uh, some kind of profile for for the public so that they'll know that we're around and that we're going to be coming back. Um, so I would thank you very much, Linda. I, I'd like to just finish by reading. I read an interview with uh, Karen Zacharias. And in this interview, she had an interesting quote, and I think this will be kind of food for thought for people who are watching and, and I hope are going to tune in again on next Tuesday, September 30th. No. 29th. 29th, September 29th at 7 p.m. on Tuesday, and then on Thursday, October 1st at 2 p.m. And this is what, she said, and keep this in mind, everyone who's who's been who's stayed with us for this this talk. She said, you go into this play judging each couple in terms of who's wrong and who's right, but you leave judging yourself. In other words, what would I how do I feel? You know, what side would I kind of be? And I thought I thought that made me think, well, she was thinking of you know, she wanted you to walk away with something more than a lot of laughs. So I th I'm looking forward to seeing this now, particularly since we've had this talk, uh, Linda. And again, thank you so much for, for I was going to say for being here, but well, being here virtually. So. Well, thank, thank you. I've enjoyed the talk. Yeah, thanks, Linda. And thank you all for tuning in. And please watch the show next week. Thank you all and, and goodbye till next time.